Good afternoon and uh, a warm welcome to this year's Charles Clark Memorial Lecture. Uh, my name is William Bowes, I'm Director of Policy at the UK Publishers Association and I will be introducing um, our speakers today and, and also taking part in a, in a question and answer session uh, with, with Commissioner Ansip later on. Um, in recent years, this stage has seen some of the world's most eminent legal academics, judges and practitioners provide us with their perspective on copyright and how it is developing in this fast-moving digital world. But this year's lecture comes at a time where more than ever, the relationship between content, knowledge, information and the law is being actively debated, not just in the corridors of power and the law courts, but also the court of public opinion. The list of the top 10 largest companies in the world is now dominated by those engaged in the act of publishing. Sadly, none of those are current PA members, but we live in hope. But barely a week goes by without the issues of online behavior, truth and fact, content regulation, and the link between information and geopolitics being at the center of international media debate. <coughs> All of this taken together means that copyright is now being seen and discussed as something that affects not just our economy, but also our democracy and our society. It is for this reason that it only seems right for the focus of this year's Charles Clark Memorial Lecture to be on the relationship between copyright, politics, and policy making. In doing so, we have taken the liberty of borrowing the title for this year's talk from Mr. Clark himself, The Politics of Knowledge. I never had the privilege of meeting Charles Clark. And, and Anne Bergen from the Federation of European Publishers will speak more about him and his work shortly. But it is clear to me from the many speeches and articles of his that I have read that this current spate of policy making would have seen him in his element, using his experience and unique perspective as publisher, lawyer, and in his own hugely understated words, someone with an interest in copyright, to explain the views of the publishing constituency and crucially find a workable solution for all concerned. Charles Clark committed many years of his life to working on EU policy matters. He was, an acti he was active not just in EU copyright but also in the formulation of database rights and other attempts to update the law in the early years of digital. He was a wonderful advocate for British publishing in Brussels. And overall, whilst of course there were still things he would like to continue to be lobbying on, as we all do, I think he would have been pleased to see the Commission introduce a digital single market package that aimed to create a functioning and fair marketplace and also a world that balanced the interests of authors, publishers and readers alike. But his speeches also remind me of the emphasis he placed on the need for us as publishers to tell our own story better, to explain who we are and why it is that good books, a term he understandably used literally but I now use conceptually, are such an important and fundamental part of the society we live in, and indeed, humanity itself. Indeed, in 1973, the year of the UK's accession to the European Union, Mr. Clark gave a speech where he said the following, the unique property of man is the encoding of thought for communication, which nowadays we call language. Language is the key to individual and social progress. The book, is nothing less than language stabilized and held for attention. I think we can all agree that the world could use some stability and better attention at the moment, and publishers are perfectly placed to provide it. But one man who has also worked very hard to provide order, certainty, and stability in the digital world today is our speaker, Commissioner Andrus Ansip. Mr. Ansip is a vice president of the European Commission and as many of you will know, is in the midst of overseeing a far-reaching update of copyright law in the European Union that is designed to update EU copyright for the digital age. <coughs> Anne Bergman from the Federation of European Publishers will add her own words of welcome in a moment. But on behalf of the UK Publishers Association and Charles Clark's family, I wanted to say a warm welcome and thank you for reaching out to Hand of Friendship at this time. All of us in UK publishing expect to play a full and committed role in the world of European publishing and policy making in the years to come both on an individual basis and also via our ongoing membership of the Federation of European Publishers, which we are very pleased to be able to continue. We look forward to working with you further, Mr. Ansip, in the years ahead. Before handing over to Anne, I would like to thank all of those who have made today possible, including London Book Fair, our sponsors, PLS, CLA, FEP, and IPA. 
And I would also like to welcome Mrs. Fiona Clark and her daughter, Rachel. For all of us who work in copyright, this is truly a highlight of our year, and we're very grateful for all of you that you do to make this possible. I'd finally like to thank Emma House for organising today's event. And without further ado, I will now ask Anne Bergman from the Federation of European Publishers to say a few words. Dear Mr. Vice President of the European Commission, dear Mr. Minister of Culture of Estonia, dear Fiona, dear colleagues, dear friends, I'm privileged to have been asked to make the introduction of this your talk. I'm also privileged to have been able to call Charles Clark not just a colleague, but also a friend. European copyright and Charles. The history of the European Union copyright frameworks very much coincides with Charles' involvement in Europe. I first met Charles over the Rental and Lending Directive in 92. From then on, Charles was actively involved in European copyright issue, and this until the adoption of the Directive on the Harmonization of Certain Aspects of Copyright and Related Rights in the Information Society that most of you better know as the Copyright Directive. That was in 2001. In this year, we work not just over exclusive rights for the rights holders, but also exception, including the lendings of books by library, but also on the Term of Protection Directive, extending the term from 50 to 70 years, and on the database directive, which is so crucial for many publishers. Copyright was then a completely different affair. There were already diverging views, and I think that's inevitable, but they were expressed in courteous and polite manners. It was not yet the era of alternative facts. The parties produced evidence which was then debated. This is, and I think we are all witness to that, no longer the case. I've read in the lecture, the brochure of the lecture, that Charles travelled regularly to Brussels to represent UK interests in copyright. Charles did indeed travel frequently to Brussels, Fiona will remember that, but also he quite brilliantly Everyone who's known Charles will remember, represent the interests of British publishers. Yet, as it is the case still today, these interests very much coincide with those of colleagues from all over Europe. Charles was a dedicated European, and his defense of a fair balance in copyright to encourage creativity served the entire European publishing community. I miss Charles as a witty and smart colleague and as a friend. We all miss the likes of Charles today in a copyright world where views are as polarized as they can be, or at least I hope they cannot get more polarized. A world when you disagree with the other party, you are threatening freedom of expression, you want to kill the internet. Mr. Vice President, you are honoring us publishers and all colleagues from the book sector with your presence at the London Book Fair. I hope this rapid visit has reinforced your conviction that we, at the service of our authors, have a key objective. That is to make books and other creative works we publish as widely available as possible. Freedom of expression, that is for us, freedom to publish is an essential element of our industry. This is the key ambition of publisher. And this ambition goes further. It aims at addressing and even anticipating, if possible, the needs of our readers, users. It aims at allowing teachers to play with the digital content and to combine it with their own content or additional resources. It aims at allowing researchers to mine the publication to advance science, just to name two. To make this happen, investment are required. Copyright is the cornerstone of both this ambition and these investments. The proposal you put on the table uh, a few months ago to modernize the copyright framework, 
are reasonable. They appreciate the importance of licensing. They address the European Court of Justice decision in the HP Reprobel case by restoring the existing situation, recognizing that publishers are rights holders by virtue of their publishing contract. The three compulsory exceptions for text and data mining, an issue dealt with by the British legislator in its reform in 2014, limiting it to non-commercial purposes. For illustration for teaching with a license override, like the one existing in the UK and many other countries, and the last for preservation, provided it remains for that purpose, a balance to a large extent. Publishers stress that most issues can be dealt with by contractual negotiated solution. <coughs> Sorry. Let's hope that the inter-institutional negotiation will end up with a balanced text. These negotiations are in full swing, but it would take too long and it would be too cumbersome to describe them here. I would never let, nevertheless suggest to all of you willing to retain the balance in copyright to reach to the legislator, to reach to your governments and to reach to your members of parliament to stress this point. Please contact us at the FEP or your local publisher association to, to get more information. Let me draw your Mr. Vice President and your audience attention on the words negotiation and licensing. <coughs> In some circles, negotiation is seen as unilateral, rather ruthless decision by rights holders to impose their rules. And the same can be heard of licensing. It is quite the opposite. Wherever the national legislator has opted for licensing, for example, to facilitate illustration for teaching, like in the UK, this has required from the rights holders to negotiate. And I've taken, I could have chosen the other university, but I've taken the Cambridge Dictionary <coughs> definition. The process of the negotiation is a process of discussing with someone something in order to reach an agreement with them. And that's exactly what we're doing when we are negotiating license, whether individually or collectively. Whether it's for TDM or illustration for teaching, or even for the out of commerce works. And I hope that we will find a solution that will cover all schemes, including the French system, Relire. Licensing is key. After long negotiation, and that's sometimes done by individual publishers or collectively by a collective management organization, all users can use our books, journals, digital content as they consider necessary and we get appropriately remunerated. <coughs> to state quite the obvious, educational and academic publishing has only one market. And investment in these fields must continue to be encouraged. Again, licensing is a way forward. However, some countries have chosen and will continue to do so. <coughs> Hola to permit certain uses under copyright exception. We ask that when such choice is made, <coughs> excuse me, it gives me the opportunity to drink water. These use are compensated and that compensation be shared between authors and publisher. We want again to thank you very much for having drafted the Article 12 of the DSM Directive, clarifying the intention of the EU and national law. When this provision will be passed, it will simply allow the member states to keep the scheme as they are for the moment, and publisher alongside authors to get compensated <coughs> for the use of the books, journals, and digital publication. So before I let you listen to the Vice President of the Commission and recover my voice, I want to leave you with Charles' forward-looking mantra. The answer to the machine is in the machine. We, and the we is broader than the publisher, <coughs> or even the book community itself, need to bring technological solutions to some of the challenges created by the machine. In the UK, the Copyright Hub has been addressing this issue. 
The EU is funding the Auditor project that we had the chance to show you today to develop the right inf data infrastructure. That's what we need. Simple, flexible solution to allow the content we produce to be read and eventually repurposed while respecting patrimonial and moral rights in a seamless way. For that to happen, we need two things. We need research and we need political support. <coughs> we count on the European Commission to uphold and promote the first cultural industry in Europe, publishing by ensuring balanced legislation and technology that will tr facilitate transaction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, I'd like to invite Commissioner Antip to, to deliver his address. Thank you. Honourable Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to cordially thank all the organizers of uh, uh, this uh, London Book Fair. I'm really impressed already. And of course, I would like to thank you for inviting <coughs> me to take part in this uh, event. It is an honor to give uh, this year's uh, Charles Clark Memorial Lecture. While I'm no expert in copyright law, I do share one objective with many illustrious speakers uh, who have delivered uh, the lecture in the past. That is to find a way to modernize copyright law, maintain protection for authors, and maximize access to creativity and culture for current and future generations of readers. Culture is at the heart of the European project as a way of going beyond borders. But it should not be kept within borders. Cultural lock-in does not help or serve anybody in the European Union or anywhere uh, for that matter. Culture is not some kind of accessory to the European idea. It is an integral part of it. Europe's rich and diverse cultural heritage binds us all together. When copyright law was first introduced in the early 18th century, it was a watershed moment. Three centuries further on, we should ask if today's copyright rules are still keeping up with the developments. Are they fit for the digital age? The short answer is no. EU copyright rules have clearly evolved a great deal since uh, the 18th century. But uh, they were developed uh, before the digital revolution was starting to take off. Before people had heard of Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. Before digital platforms even existed. <coughs> Consumer demands and expectations are now very different compared with 10 years ago, or even five. Digital technologies have transformed beyond recognition how creative content is produced, distributed, and marketed. Take the surge in digital publishing, the digitization of back catalogs or e-books. They took off at astonishing speed when they properly emerged, although uh, that growth now appears to have slowed somewhat. Digitalization has led to many new business models. As you know yourselves, the internet has become the main marketplace for distribution and access to copyright protected uh, material. Our rules should reflect these new and emerging online uses. Like you, 
I want European publishing to retain its leading global position. That is why reforming rules on copyright lies at the heart of our plan to build a digital single market in Europe. It aims to keep our creative and cultural industries competitive in the digital age. We plan to achieve that by stimulating cultural diversity, getting more culture to circulate around Europe, and creating new opportunities for creators and the content industry. Our reform proposals are all designed with these aims in mind, taking both economic and social angles into account. From a business perspective, I know that the primary concern is to make sure of uh, recovering uh, your investments in new talent and uh, creativity. Publishers have to take many risks starting with the courage of believing in the potential of an author before making an initial investment. That willingness to take risks deserves to be rewarded. Authors also deserve reward and recognition for their efforts in artistic creativity. To me, this is a basic function of copyright. It is why we need fair and clear <coughs> rules for everyone involved across the publishing value chain. This includes digital platforms. They have responsibilities to contribute back into that value chain. They should also be more active in fighting piracy and illegal material posted online. As publishers, you need better leverage to improve your negotiations with them. Let me go into a little more detail of what I mean. I will start with a value gap. This is about everyone involved in creating a cultural product uh, being paid fairly for their contribution. The issue of fair payment or share of revenue has become a particular challenge when it comes to ma material accessed via digital platforms. But uh, the new uh, distribution or access channels are also about being transparent about how the material is used and what is earned from using it. Our copyright reform gives publishers and authors the means to negotiate better with digital platforms. Rights holders will be in a stronger and fairer position to negotiate and be paid when a platform puts their work online. The legal bargaining position of press publishers needs similar improvement and clarity. We propose a special right to help them negotiate licenses with online services for use of their material and to enforce their rights in the digital environment. This right already exists in EU law for film producers, record producers, um, and broadcasters. To me, it is only fair that it should also apply to press publishers. Not only will it help them to fight piracy and unauthorized use of your material, it will also help to maintain an independent and uh, high-quality press in Europe. Our proposal does not change the scope of current copyright protection and case law, including for hyperlinking. I think this is reasonable. What is not reasonable is to take bloggers to court for hyperlinking uh, to an article. 
as you know, I do not support the idea of a hyperlink tax. Then, authors. Everyone here knows that uh, the publishing industry should not exist without them. As publishers, you work with authors every day and know uh, the difficulties that many of them face just to earn a living. Again, this concerns balance in contractual <coughs> relationships. It also concerns transparency, since authors often cannot check how, how their work is used online or measure its success. The Commission's copyright proposals help um, authors and performers to obtain fair pay when negotiating with producers and publishers who will have uh, to be transparent about uh, the revenues they make from particular works. Before I fin finish, I want to mention another aspect of copyright law that our reform will address exceptions. We have proposed new exceptions for public libraries, museums, and archives. These do not destroy publishers' business models, but they do help to give more access to knowledge as well as remove legal uncertainty for teachers. Another proposed exception is for text and data mining. This is a promising and important tool for scientists and researchers. They need access to large volumes of data to develop new knowledge and insights. Scientific journals and articles are a major source of that data, usually online. But text and data mining is developing only slowly, mainly due to legal uncertainty. Our proposal would require all EU countries to allow research organizations uh, such as universities and uh, research institutes to carry out text and data mining uh, of copyright protected content to which they have lawful access without prior authorization. I'm aware that uh, this is a sensitive issue, far from straightforward. That is why we have included safeguards to maintain uh, the integrity and security of publishers' databases and limited the scope to research. Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to books, much has been written and said about uh, the looming demise of paper. But despite the years of warnings, it has not yet happened. Yes, if you look at uh, the sales figures, it might appear that uh, the writing is on the wall for print books. But in Europe, at least, books are still one of the main products purchased online. Perhaps there is hope for the two formats to coexist uh, peacefully. Time will tell. In this context, let me say that I have supported uh, the removal of uh, VAT on e-books. I hope that uh, this will soon be a reality. One thing is clear to me, however, new forms of content and creativity can come from the least expected quarters, especially in a world that is being changed so much by digital technology. Since I'm speaking to publishers, I, it seems up to end with a quote. But uh, this is not a quote from a book or from printed media. In 2009, the actor and author uh, Stephen Fry tweeted 
what has become perhaps uh, one of the best known quotes about e-books. One technology doesn't replace another, it complements. Books are no more threatened by Kindle than stairs by elevators. Food for thought in this digital age. Thank you for your attention. It has been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Commissioner Ansip, and that was a, a wonderful um, uh, talk through um, the various provisions of the DSM and all the work that you've been doing to, to support um, publishing and publishers on that. Um, I wondered if I could ask you a few questions before I um, throw it open to the floor, if I may. Um, so, um, you, you, talked, um, you talked about the work that's being done with, with the press publishers, right, and, and um, of course, one of the reasons why it's very why we see the effects of, uh, on journalism recently around fake news. Um, how much of a concern has that been within the European Commission and, and beyond the work that you're doing on the press publishers, right? Um, what, what sort of conversations are going on around that particular phenomenon and, and supporting people and the quality of journalism and independence? Yes, as uh, I hope everybody knows, we launched uh, uh, a proposal uh, according uh, with the uh, press publishers. We'll get uh, their... Uh, neighboring rights. And um, I think, uh, as I said also uh, on my speech, uh, it's just fair to, to provide those neighboring rights to press publishers. In the uh, 1960s, last century, record labors, for example, they got to their neighboring rights. And what's the difference between Record labels and, uh, and press publishers. Record labels, they have to invite drummers, singers, musicians, uh, those people who will record uh, those uh, masterpieces uh, to studio. Publishers, they have to invite journalists, photographers uh, uh, to take care about layouts. Uh, the role is almost the same. But uh, record labels, so they got to their uh, neighboring rights last century already, and press publishers, they didn't get. Why? I think uh, it's, of course, simplification, but uh, at that time, press publishers, uh, they didn't ask for those neighboring rights. They said, uh, publishers, uh, they are just neutral intermediaries, and uh, let uh, those uh, journalists or, or uh, photographers, uh, they will be liable. And now, press publishers, they are unhappy. Quality media is totally unhappy because uh, they are losing their revenues. Somebody else is using um, uh, their content uh, without providing fair remuneration. And I think it will be absolutely fair to provide neighboring rights also to uh, publishers, to press publishers at first, but uh, I think for all the publishers. And it will help uh, uh, publishers to, to negotiate with the uh, big uh, uh, platforms. And um, I hope, thanks to this uh, uh, neighboring rights, uh, um, our authors uh, will be also more fairly remunerated and uh, if we can provide fair remuneration to our authors, uh, then we can hope uh, our media will be really quality media. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are people in this room listening to you talk about the difference between record labels and press publishers and wondering why there's a difference between press publishers and, for example, journals publishers or, or other kinds of publishers. Is that, what, what is the policy reason behind uh, the distinction? Made? I think uh, um, this situation for uh, a press publisher is uh, is really urgent uh, situation because uh, uh, somebody is using, as I said, uh, their content without providing uh, fair remuneration, and it's uh, it's uh, in a very large scale uh, <coughs> today. And uh, uh, this is uh, the reason uh, why uh, we took at first uh, uh, 
press publishers and uh, we proposed uh, this neighboring rights at first to uh, press publishers. As you know, uh, there are a lot of um, tensions around uh, this proposal. Uh, some people, they think that uh, with this proposal we will get, uh, we will kill uh, freedom of expression, uh, there will be no freedom for uh, linking or hyperlinking, Hyper hyperlinking will be taxed, etc. No way. Uh, it's uh, written also in, uh, in our proposal that uh, <clears throat> uh, hyperlinking will stay as a basic principle in the internet forever. With our proposal, we will not change uh, existing uh, case law. Uh, it will stay as it is. Thank you very much. Um, w one other issue um, uh, which, which your answer may, may have touched in people's minds is, is around open access and open science. How, how does the European Union's agenda around, around copyright and digital single market come together with the, with the open science agenda? What do those conversations sound like in Brussels? When we started as a new commission, then our aim was uh, to provide better access to digital content to our people. But uh, we never uh, thought about uh, free of charge access. Our aim was and is to provide also fair remuneration to our authors, to protect our authors. And uh, it's possible to reach both aims, to provide better access, including cross-border access to our people to digital content, copyrighted content, and to provide also fair remuneration to our authors. When talking about some new technologies, for example, artificial intelligence, then artificial intelligence without access to data is nonsense. And when looking what is happening now around the world, then we can see uh, what kind of uh, huge data sets uh, they can uh, uh, use uh, for those purposes in China, for example. If you have 1.3 billion images, not only portraits, but also profiles, and, and this way, then uh, it's, uh, it's quite... Uh, quite easy to create, uh, for example, facial recognition systems. Or when thinking about Americans, uh, then uh, they have those uh, Amazons and, and Googles and Facebooks, and uh, they have enough uh, data to teach uh, their computers. When even thinking about cloud service providers, then uh, when looking on, uh, on uh, European cloud service providers, uh, by the way, this area is highly developed in Europe, uh, Fifty percent of uh, those cloud volumes, uh, they are also provided by Amazon, uh, Microsoft, IBM. And even when, uh, when thinking about our hospitals, for example, then with artificial intelligence uh, uh, we can save um, uh, lives of our people, Cancer diagnostics, for example, um, it's possible because of uh, uh, artificial intelligence also. But uh, once again, some big global service providers are able to provide uh, those, uh, this assistance to our medical doctors with a lower price. And at the same time, they will get access also to data. But uh, what about European? startups, small and medium-sized businesses. So I think uh, it's possible to reuse data. And uh, it's uh, really important to provide uh, to also to European entrepreneurs access uh, to data. But once again, um, fair remuneration is needed. So it, it has to be an agreement between two parties. I'm not uh, talking about confiscation of uh, uh, some kind of data. So, so coming on to data and the big platforms, a lot of the news in the UK recently has been around data privacy and issues with big platforms and, and, and hacking and, and those sorts of problems. Um, uh, GDPR is coming very soon. 
Um, what are what are your hopes for GDPR, um, which has set new standards? Both both the EU has continually set new standards around protection for data. What are your hopes for GDPR outside of Europe as well as as well as its successful implementation within Europe to drive behaviours around data protection online? In those days, I think not only in the United Kingdom, but everywhere in Europe and uh, and around the world, people they are talking about Cambridge Analytica and and Facebook. So um, we can say that somehow we were able to predict what uh, some people they can de uh, they can do with uh, with our data, and uh, that's why. Uh, to launch uh, this general data protection regulation was a really good idea. Um, Facebook uh, at first announced that uh, they will uh, implement uh, general data protection uh, regulation only in Europe. But later, later on, uh, Sherry Sandberg stated that, no, no, they will implement uh, this general data protection regulation globally, everywhere across the world. I think, um, and I'm, I'm absolutely sure, we have to protect our basic uh, values. Uh, we have to protect uh, those uh, uh, fundamental rights of our uh, people and, and privacy is, is one of those rights. Too often, uh, some politicians, uh, they think that uh, uh, security is fundamental rights and politicians so they have to guarantee security of our people and they think that um, privacy is somehow not so important at all but I don't think so. We have to find the right balance between protection of everybody's privacy and, uh, and providing security to our, our people. So this was just one example how uh, Europe uh, can um, somehow even dictates uh, some kind of global rules. When thinking about uh, artificial intelligence, the same story. Too many people, they are afraid about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, 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 and uh, we all know everything, practically, what was created by our people, you can use in good purposes and in bad purposes. Knife, for example. You can cut cucumbers, but... Somebody can kill people with knife. Artificial intelligence, the same story. So uh, we have to create uh, uh, those uh, global, uh, common uh, ethical principles, how to deal with uh, artificial intelligence, what is allowed and what is not allowed. And once again, protection of everybody's privacy has to be in center of... Uh, Cool of our attention. Thank you. So two other core principles for us as publishers are around free trade and free speech. And freedom to publish and free speech gives us the, and our authors the ability to publish our thoughts and our ideas and share them around the world. And obviously free trade allows us to have the global marketplaces that allows those to be shared and, and cultures across borders to, to grow. We're in a, a time where other countries are are challenging those principles, but the EU is very much standing behind them. Do you, is this, are those concepts that, that, that are in your dialogue with other countries that are coming up in conversation? And, and, and how, how can the EU support those two principles in the years ahead? Yes, once again, we, we have to talk about the, this uh, conflict between uh, security of our people and uh, freedom of expression. Uh, but we have to find the uh, uh, right balance. Um, illegal content, hate speech on platforms, uh, uh, fake news. Um, we have to deal with those issues. But at the same time, we have to protect also freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. um, after every terrorist attack, there are some politicians who say that internet is guilty in all bad happening around the world. But we remember, uh, books were guilty, films were guilty, video was guilty and everything bad, what happened around the world. And uh, I don't think uh, just internet is 
can be guilty in everything bad happening uh, around the world. We have to protect also freedom of expression. When talking about um, fake news or illegal content, hate speech on platforms, then too often uh, people, they say that uh, we have to set strict rules, we have to set some, some real penalties to those platforms, uh, they have to be liable, responsible, and, and then uh, everybody will be happy. My background is, um, is maybe well known. I'm from Estonia, and Estonia was occupied by the uh, Soviet Union during the 50 years. And uh, people from socialist countries, from countries which were occupied, uh, they remember how uh, effective those authorities were in uh, um, usage, usage of uh, preventive measures, then uh, 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 they were really effective uh, in censorship, and with effective censorship uh, they were able to create even more effective self-censorship why I have to create problems for myself, better I will not make this statement, and, 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 and so on. And um, now we can see there are some kind of um, similar trends uh, uh, today in, in Europe. So in Germany they launched uh, this uh, uh, Netstege to deal with hate speech on online platforms. Uh, and uh, if fine is uh, 50 million uh, euros, then what platforms uh, they have to do in case of doubts? If you have some doubts, then down, down, down. And um, I don't think it's, um, it's uh, about uh, uh, free speech, it's about freedom of expression. We have to believe in common sense of uh, our people. As it was, uh, was said already more than 100 years ago, you can fool all the people some of the time, and some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. They say, said that it was said by Abraham Lincoln, but uh, other people, they said that he never stated something, something like that, but uh, it's valid anyway today. Thank you. Well, um, so I'm not sure whether that lands us on fake news or free speech, but in the spirit of free speech, I wonder if um, we have any questions from the floor um, for Commissioner Ansip in, in the few minutes we have remaining. Um, as the Vice President knows, I've been one of the great proponents of uh, the press publisher's right, not surprisingly. Um, and one of the uh, key elements of the proposal from the Euro European Commission is to empower right holders to negotiate with other businesses um, for the release of their content. But one of the other challenges uh, that we face as publishers is, is, is to sell content to consumers. And um, we see more and more press publishers launching subscription models in, in Europe. It's, it's increasing and with some success. But I am asked time and time again by members of the European Parliament and national experts what publishers are going to do about micropayments because they have, there are willingness of um, consumers to pay, but they have now got used to being able to find bits of content um, from lots of different sources all over the, the web. And the, the answer from the publishers is that it, it's very, very expensive to offer micropayment solutions. And I wonder if inside the Commission you've had discussions about how we can work together on research and innovation projects to help publishers in this area. Thank you. It's, it's really so that uh, if you... Sometimes people, they, they would like to put some uh, uh, photos to their blog posts or, or uh, Twitter uh, accounts. Uh, but uh, those photos, uh, they are protected by copyright. 
and it's too difficult to clear rights. And those Italians, and they created a solution, really good solution. Just one click, you have to pay a euro or three euros, or even if you would like to use for commercial purposes of this photo, uh, 50,000 uh, uh, contacts, then you have to pay six euros. I myself, I would like to act as an honest taxpayer and honest citizen. Uh, I don't want to steal, and I like that kind of uh, solution. Uh, practically all our proposals uh, dealing with the copyrights uh, issues, uh, they are targeting uh, licensing, how to facilitate licensing, how to make this uh, process more easier for users. Um, and uh, I think uh, this, is, uh, this is the right way to, to deal with, uh, with the copyrights. I would like to say that um, uh, publishers, they are really innovative people. When in some other sectors, when you're starting uh, with uh, some kind of negotiations, uh, they can say that uh, we are more than happy. Don't touch existing copyright rules. It works well. Then uh, uh, publishers, they are working with, with new ideas and uh, the fact that among uh, global uh, ranking lists of uh, publishers, in top 10, there are seven European publishers, is um, a solid evidence how, um, how uh, European publishers are able to adopt, how, they are able to, how much are they are able to create uh, uh, really innovative uh, solutions. So um, it's great pleasure to work together with the European press publishers. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. I possibly have time for just one more. I am a publisher in my country. We publish a lot of bestsellers, but also um, critical content of uh, uh, journalists, uh, very critical with the power. Uh, I had the Vatican, or I had the, uh, the president of my country uh, sue my company and my authors for what is written. I haven't taken it down what was written. I went to the tribunal to defend the content of my authors. Um, whereas my experience is uh, that platforms, they immediately take, uh, take off what can be uh, not cost effective to keep on. And uh, uh, anyway, they don't feel they are responsible. Uh, I think I spent about two millions in the past 10 years defending my authors, their content, and so on. And I would like the, the people to understand the difference between the content when there is a publisher behind and when there isn't. Uh, but I would like also the platform to be responsible as uh, publishers are of what is published in their... Um, I, I think you, you thought this was a limit uh, to the freedom of expression. Uh, but I think uh, also platforms, also in the internet, there should be the same kind of responsibility that the publisher have to, to carry. So maybe I didn't understand well your point. Platforms, uh, they are already liable today, but according to e-commerce uh, directive, there is a, a so-called limited liability principle. It means uh, uh, until platforms, uh, they don't know that uh, something uh, was, uh, some kind of content was uh, uploaded um, uh, illegally, or this content was illegal, uh, they are not uh, liable. But if, according to somebody's notice, they will be informed that uh, there is legal content used illegally on this platform or illegal content, um, then they have to react. They have to take town or to 
respond to say that, uh, sorry, according to our understanding, this, is, this was uploaded uh, uh, fully, illegal, fully legally. So, uh, we cannot say that uh, uh, platforms, uh, they are not uh, liable uh, for all uh, what is uploaded today on, 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 uh, on those platforms. So, uh, but uh, they can do much more. Um, let's take this uh, example from music industry about value cap. As, uh, as we know, uh, musicians, uh, they are quite unhappy with platforms because um, some platforms uh, based on uh, subscription uh, they have 140 million subscribers uh, they, uh, and uh, they are able to contribute to uh, musicians uh, uh, 2 billion years. At the same time, there are some other platforms supported by ads. They have near to 1 billion contacts per month. But um, they are contributing only uh, 643 million years. Pretty unequal. And of course, musicians, uh, they are unhappy. They say that um, it's difficult to get uh, money from some platforms, and if they ask uh, to take down their content, it, it takes uh, weeks or even months, and then when they finally will take down this content, uh, after two minutes, somebody else will upload once again the same content on the same platforms. And now musicians, they ask, please take it down and keep it down. So this is uh, the reason why uh, we proposed also to use technical tools uh, to take down content, but also to identify authors. Some platforms, uh, they are pretty good in identifying authors. And um, according to some platforms, uh, uh, they are able to identify 95% uh, of uh, all the songs uploaded on platforms, and uh, they are able to, to ask authors, we, would you like to uh, monetize this content or would you like to, uh, to ask us to take down this content? 90% of those uh, authors, uh, they say they would like to monetize uh, the content. 10% of uh, those authors, they say they would like to take down this content. But uh, we cannot uh, always trust those uh, uh, technical tools, automated uh, uh, filters, because we all remember uh, this story with the Norwegian biggest uh, newspaper. Uh, they, uh, this newspaper put on a Facebook account uh, photo. This was naked girl. And of course, Facebook uh, uh, took down this content. And then Prime Minister of Norway, Erna Solberg, had to intervene because this wasn't about child pornography. It was this Napalm girl Vietnamese girl, and uh, this is exactly about freedom of expression, because uh, this photo, this is about, yeah, carries really strong anti-war message. <laughs> so, um, human factor will be needed also in future. Well, thank you. That's a rather reassuring note to end on what was a, a really good exploration of digital issues. Uh, Commissioner Ansett, you, you've been hugely supportive of publishing and we're all very grateful for the work you've done. You've clearly shown uh, uh, in your speech today a great understanding of our issues and our concerns and, and thank you for engaging with many publishers earlier on in the day as well. Uh, we're also grateful for your fascinating insight on the different issues that are out there in the world today, which is great for people to hear and also taking some questions. So. Um, uh, once again, on, on behalf of, of the UK Publishers Association, I'd like to thank you for coming here and thank you very much. Thank you very much.